Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, and I believe that all readers should read children's literature, especially adults. So that's what we do on the Kid Lit Love podcast. We celebrate all things children's literature, picture books, early readers, middle grade, and young adult novels too. Whether you're an adult reading to your inner child or connecting the young readers in your lives with fantastic books, you've come to the right place. Each week, we'll talk to a different children's literature author and discuss their books, their hopes and dreams for readers, their writing process, and much, much more. So grab a notebook to build your TBR, and let's get to today's episode of Kid Lit Love. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Kid Lit Love podcast. I'm Stephanie, your Kid Lit Loving host, inviting you to another weekly conversation with a children's literature author, and I get to say illustrator today. Today, I'm talking with the author-illustrator team, Kao Kalia Yang and Ku Vu. Together, they've created a beautiful, moving picture book titled Caged, a book about the resilient power of freedom dreams. It's equal parts powerful and stunning with a message of hope that readers can't help but feel deep in their readers' hearts. Kao and Ku, welcome to Kid Lit Love. I am so glad you're here. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm happy to be here as well. Thank you for having us. Oh, absolutely. I am thrilled because I get to talk to you both at the same time. And, you know, picture books are just these magnificent little gifts we can hold in our hands that are equal parts powerful words, equal parts powerful illustration. And I feel like as readers, we experience them a little bit more deeply, at least in my own experience because of that combination. And so it's just, it's an honor to talk to you both today. And while I know it's, it may be a first collaboration for the two of you together, you both have this wonderful backstory of projects and writing and books and illustrations. And so I'd love to start there to get to know a little bit more about the two of you. So Cow, let's start with you. Can you tell us about you, about your work, maybe some of your earlier titles? Because I know you are both writing for adults and for children. I am. I am the author now of 11 books, six for children, um, and uh, five for adults. So this is actually going to be book number 12. Cage is book number 12 when it comes out um, at the end of May. I I began my career because of love. My grandmother never learned how to read or write. She had never gone to school. And whenever they dropped me off at college, she'd say, may I one day when you graduate, grandma's going to get out of this car and I'll walk around with you and you can show me anything you want. And in my senior year, just before my graduation, my grandma took a fall. I went to her and I said, Grandma, get up. And she said, no, there are, there are people who loved me before you. Before you, I had a mom and a dad, brothers and sisters, your grandpa, my most precious baby girl. You can't cry for me to stay. It's time for me to go. And so I became a writer because I, I wanted my grandma to know that I would never forget her. Our big fear was that she would be forgotten. And that was, of course, the birth of the late homecomer, which made a writer out of me. I followed out the song, Poet, A Story of My Father's Life, which just premiered last year as a Minnesota opera. So that was very exciting. Wow. And then Somewhere in the Unknown World, a collective refugee memoir from wars of the last hundred years by people, people from all walks of life. And then recently, Where Rivers Part, a memoir of my mother's life, which closes up the family memoirs that I that I know I wanted to do in the beginning. My children's book career began because of an elderly neighbor who had loved his wife. And when she passed away, Bob would come out every day, watch the kids play across the street, and he would just weep. So one day I crossed over and my daughter crossed with me and she said, can I draw in your driveway? If you don't like it, the rain will come and wash it away. And he said, go ahead. And Bob and I are talking and she comes up and she says, I'm done. And Bob said, what did you draw for me? And she says, a map into the world in case you need it. And we looked and there was a map leading to the garden, another one leading to the grass. 
and one leading to the street, and there she drew the whole world smiling. And Bob started laughing, and so I said, Bob, what if I turn this into a picture book? And he had never, I mean, at that point, I had never been a picture book before. And he said to me, you would be turning a weed into a flower. But his tears had dried. And so I said, have you not seen my garden? And it begins. He laughs some more. And a map into the world entered the world and made a children's book writer out of me. And since then, the stories have just kept on coming. And they will continue to keep coming. Wow. What what a beautiful introduction. What a beautiful legacy that you bring to to your writing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing for sharing that. It makes me look at your your books, especially your picture books that I have read um with just even more love in my eyes looking at them knowing where they they have come from. Thank you. Thank you. Who, how about, how about you? Tell us your story of illustration and, and bringing things to life. Um, your story was so beautiful, um, Kalia. <laughs> Mine is more, I guess, practical, but um, I, I was a graphic designer um, by training. And then I started my career in educational publishing. So I kind of had already a, like a bent toward like, children's um publishing um but yeah I worked for graphic as a graphic designer for like 10 years and then um I had my daughter and then that kind of like piqued my interest into children's um like art and illustration um and then I guess when she was like starting school I kind of felt like I wanted to transition more to illustration um so that's kind of it. But um, this is my first um, book to illustrate. Um, so I'm very nervous and <laughs> I'm a little bit like, I don't know what I'm doing, but um, I'm really um, glad it was one of um, Gokalia's um, stories that I got to illustrate first. It must be nerve wracking to put a piece of yourself like that into the world but as a reader don't worry it's beautiful it's wonderful people will absolutely love it the message everything behind it as I opened up the the story you know it's moving the words are just so powerful but it's stunning and it's beautiful and together you just really have something kind of magical here. So no worries. <laughs> no worries. And congratulations on on the first the first book coming out. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm just like I was I always wanted to do an, a children's book, but then I always felt like, I don't know, I probably have to write my own because nobody will want to work with me because I like don't have a reputation or anything. But then I got um an email from our publisher and it happened to be like um Goka Leah and up here everyone knows Goka Leah right <laughs> so um I was like so shocked and amazed and I was like oh my gosh this is like a dream come true so I'm I'm really really happy yeah and it sounds like for both of you your your children have a little a little nudge in that direction from you Ku just thinking oh okay this children's literature world and then kind of kicking off your um children's literature career as well. And we can talk about the role that your your daughter has also played in, in Caged as well. But kids are wonderful, right? They kind of nudge us in directions that may be really good for us. And I'm I'm so excited to see both of yours kind of brought brought the two of you together in this collaboration. So let's talk about Caged. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's I can't keep saying, you know, all the same words, but they are just stunning and powerful and emotional. And as a reader, like I was, I was there with you all from page one, all the way to the end. I had tears in my eyes. And that last page, I've got to say, Ku, I, there's so many things about the illustrations I love, but that last page, that last page of the emotion and the movement, it was just everything. So I would love, um, how for you to begin. Can you tell us a little bit in your own words about Caged 
and kind of what kicked off why you decided to write this book. You know, I was reading the newspapers one day and it was um, what was happening at our southwest border. And so there were images of children in cages. And my daughter, again, our children, and I have three. I have a daughter who's 10 now and identical twin boys for eight. She looked over my shoulder and she said, Mommy, are those kids in cages? And I said, yes. And then she said, what is it like to live in a cage? And at first I thought, oh, I don't know. But then I'm like, of course I do. The first six years of my life was in a big cage, only I didn't know it. And so the opening comes to me in conversation with my daughter. But after I told her about my experiences in a refugee camp, she said, mommy, you should write it for the whole world. Because right now there are still refugee camps, right? And I said, yes. And she's like, because there are still wars. And I said, yes. And so I knew I had to write it for a bigger world. And, you know, I've, I've done adult literature. I've done other children's books, but this is the first kind of ticket I've given myself to just jump anywhere. You know, this isn't memoir. It's heavily based on my experiences and my understanding of, of the realities of refugee camps everywhere. But it is it is not tied to memoir like my other books. And so I flipped away and entered into this other beautiful space of dreams. And then I knew, Ku, um, and I've always known this, in children's literature, one of the tasks of a writer is to first tickle the imagination of the illustrator. And so that scene where the children are flying, where they're drawing, uh, you know, where they're stretching their shirts wide and creating patterns in the dust, I'm like, in the hands of the right illustrator, the scene is going to open them up in different ways. And so that was me playing with the illustrator. But this story is one that I, I really believe is so relevant for our world right now. Yeah. The, the emotion is here on every, every page. I know you said it's not a memoir, but it is based on your experiences. And as I read it, for me as a reader, I couldn't help but think of the the duality of everything of, yes, it is essentially a cage, but there's one double page spread that I love that shows kind of the barbed wire, but it shows love and humanity and living and emotion and happiness and all of, all of those things. And I felt like both of you had such a beautiful balance of the reality of what it was yet the hope and the expectation and the love inside that was just so beautifully balanced throughout. I think that's why it went straight to my heart because it was a duality of both of those things. And the reader gets to hold both and grapple with both and really think about how does that matter to me? What, what do I think about that? Um, what might I be able to do about that as as well. And I'd love if one or both of you um, want to talk a little bit about that because you you have you have both in there so beautifully that I, I just couldn't stop thinking about. You know, Stephanie, I love I love that this is what you're getting from the book because this is so true of my experiences in the refugee camp and also the reality of my life. From the moment I could understand language, my father has always said to me, Menai, you're born in an ocean of love so big, your feet has never touched the bottom, your hands have never touched the sides. And that this is possible in a refugee camp, I think is so important to communicate, you know, across all of the multitudes of possibilities and realities that we occupy as human beings, or whether by force or, or whether we choose to, I think that this duality is so much an essential part of being a part of the world, being open to it, even if that world closes in around you in different ways. And so for me as a writer, it was really, really important to communicate that beauty, to communicate communicate the fun, the laughter, the joy, you know, because this is just true to any place in the world. Give children a little bit of time with each other and these things happen um, as well as the adults who love them. Ku, what were your thoughts? I'm curious as you're encountering the text and then choosing to interpret it visually. Well, um, I'm so glad that you said that, like, you can see the humanity, even though um, 
all the refugees are caged up and it's like um life is gonna continue like no matter what right um like I know my parents met and got married in a refugee camp so it's like it it is just human nature to just keep going and um I'm glad they did because then we wouldn't exist right if, if they just stopped with the war and fighting and devastation yeah. I think um there's a a page that also jumped out at me that I think captures that sometimes it's easier for children to maintain that that hope and that resilience that imagination actually thinking about the page that you mentioned where they are kind of flying around in their dreams and one one older man says like okay those those dreams they don't sound very realistic and a woman responded with one of my favorite lines um what do you know about what is real and what isn't in the head and heart of a child let the children leave here go where they want and it just shows you know as as we get older as adults grow i feel like it's harder to maintain that childlike resilience and hope and so i feel like it was such a good message for the adults reading this book to the kids in their lives as as well yeah i really um love that 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 scene that line i'm like because i know in our family we got tons of old grumpy guys <laughs> <laughs> always yelling at kids right so I felt like yeah that that was really relatable to see but I'm sorry um Kalia go ahead no not at all you know just as I love I think that the cover itself right the word the book is called cage but on the cover itself you have children flying yeah and yeah. and that, that juxtaposition I think is so important to that moment to play and the whole book you know this is a book that's going to hold big ideas and the real world with the tender arms of childhood mm -hmm. with that possibility. And I have to be honest, I think that inside my heart, you know, six-year-old Galia is very much alive and she is very much talking to me all the time and reminding me of what is and isn't possible. You know, there are days and I'm like, oh, how am I going to do this? And that voice from way back there reminds me that the impossible is possible. Yeah, it's already happened to me. It's already happened to the Hmong people. I mean, for Kuwa's family and my own, you know, we come from a war where we were not supposed to have made it. But here we are writing these stories, illustrating these books, living these lives that any elder in that war would have said, that's not possible. Where, what are you thinking? Right. And, and thankfully so, because now you get to share them with everyone else who gets to enjoy and learn and grow and, and connect with, with them too. Ku, I am so curious, both kind of figuratively and literally, how you bring stories like this to life. How did you decide on kind of the look or the feel? Because one thing that I loved is that the book, the book is varied in I don't want to say the styles, but one page may have a, a white background and then the next page conveys, you know, the darkness and then you can feel the movement and the air and sometimes things are spotlighted and sometimes um, it's what they're imagining in their mind. And I'm always so blown away <laughs> for lack of a, a more academic term of, of how you managed to bring a story that is so moving and powerful to life on the page. So I would love for you to talk about maybe the the mental process of, of how you decided to bring this to life on the page. And then like, then how, like, are you a, um, you know, a paintbrush or acrylic or are you digital? Like, I would just love for you to talk about the process. It's fascinating to me. Okay. Um, well, um, when the, our art director reached out to me, Jasmine Rubero, she actually said that um, she 
she's asking me um, if I wanted to work on the book because my style itself is kind of childlike and playful and simple. And I, she thought it would go nice against um, like Kalia's um, um, kind of type of storytelling where it's um, it's not super playful and it's almost like a little bit somber and sad and emotional and poetic. So she said that she thought it would go well, my illustration style would go well with um, Kalia's writing. And so I was like, wow, like I, <laughs> I guess that would work together just to have some balance. Um, so that's what she said. <laughs> um, and then as for my um, process, uh, I work mostly digital. And then I, I guess a lot of like the scenery, I felt like um, I grew up seeing so many pictures of the refugee camps and um, like all the houses and uh, the landscape is very hilly. And then I know Kalia had mentioned before, like there's she remembers so much like red dirt blowing around. So I wanted to incorporate all that into it. Um, as well as like just the descriptions that Kalia had in the story. Um, I wanted to play with that, like um, like the night sky. I, I That's probably one of my favorite um, pages is the soldiers uh, smoking <laughs> at night. Such a powerful page. Yeah, such a powerful image to, to think about. Yeah, and um, like, in that spread, there's this so the stark soldiers you can't see their faces or um, anything, and I just felt like I that kind of made me feel like the the hot beating sun in like the Thailand refugee camp. That's that's just what I imagine. So I kind of try to play with that and get that in there somehow, and hopefully that portrays well. It does. It does. Um, I've already said a couple of favorite pages, so I can't I can't narrow it down um, to just one. Um, and I know this is the first time you were saying before we hit record. This is the first time that you've gotten to actually see each other in in person. And I just I'm just so in awe of how the two of you brought this to life without without doing that meeting in person. It's it's gorgeous in so many ways. Thanks. You're welcome. So you both are still working on things, right? This is your first book, Ku. It is your 12th book, Kao, which is amazing. Tell us a little bit about projects you're still working on or are working on now. We'd love to hear about them. For me, this is the four book launch year. It is the busiest uh, publishing year I've had yet. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a picture book come out in March and then my memoir also in March. This one comes out in May. In September, I am debuting my first middle grade fiction. It'll come from Dutton. It's called The Diamond Explorer. It is um, very much a story about a Hmong boy who grows up on the big Minnesota prairie. In that way, it is an homage to Little House on the Prairie and that whole series that I loved as a kid. Me too. Uh, <laughs> and so that that one is coming um, but this boy is not an ordinary boy he's a boy who who's on a journey to becoming a great shaman except he doesn't know he has no idea and everybody in his life from his parents to his teachers everybody thinks they know his story but how can they know it if he himself does not and so in that way it is a very much a, a story about meeting yourself which I remember doing as a kid again and again and again. There have been so many encounters, you know, encounters of Galia, um, some that I, that, that I was afraid of. Um, and so it was a great challenge for me, and I'm very excited about its coming. Cage, and I think this is important, it's the longest, um, in terms of process, this book has taken longer than any of my other picture books. It's such a long time in the coming. The writing happened very quickly. It happened in one sitting, um, but we've edited it back and forth. And 
and in terms of just process. So I've had a lot of time to really get to know the story in an entirely intimate and in different way. Um, and I think it changes it changes a writer. You know, when you when you write a story and you keep on revisiting it in different spaces in your life, different years across a pandemic. And now as we are leaving that pandemic behind and facing in a really uncertain world in so many ways, the book is speaking to me in different ways. So I'm excited to see how this book changes the the future for me in terms of, of writing. Um, and I think that's part of the magic and the fun. We talk about how this book is now, it's like this whole thing. But Ku and I, we 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 never met before. And I think one of the things that I really love about picture books that keeps me coming back is the magic that lives there. I may know the story, but I didn't know the story in Ku's hands. I didn't know the story, you know, after Ku's art. What would happen? And even this conversation, Stephanie, like your response to the book and your questions are helping me think about it and its place in the world, um, its place in my life. So the, so there is always in the life of a writer um, this possibility that anything can happen. With a flip of a page, anything can happen. And on March, on May 28th, this page gets flipped. And it, you know, whatever is in there enters into the world and will live separate from me and Ku, which is a different kind of magic. Yeah. Yeah, that is so beautifully said because I, I truly believe in the magic that then comes when the reader reads that book and takes it up in whatever way they do based on their own reading and their own experiences. And when they flip that last page, that question of now what? Because we are changed. I believe we are changed by every book that we read. It can help us think differently, be differently, grow differently. And I think a book like this especially just makes readers pause and think deeply about the the content, about the emotions. And that gift, you know, that starts with you just keeps going through the reader who then maybe thinks differently or acts differently in, in the world. It's such a, a powerful domino effect, I think, that, that can happen in this beautiful book world that, that we have. Who, how about you? Any projects that you're working on you're, you're able to share? Um, I'm actually, well, I'm almost finished with um, a, a graphic novel. I'm working with a local um, nonprofit publisher called uh, Green Card Voices um, and they do bilingual stories um, and I'm I guess this yeah this graphic novel tells a story of a um, Hmong boy who um, he also grew up in a in a Hmong refugee camp and then he came to the U.S. Um, in the last wave um, where there they allow, the U.S. allowed um, immigrant uh, refugees to come to the U.S. and um, yeah, and, and so it kind of details his uh, his story from like being a teenager in the U.S. and adjusting, and then how he went to school, and um, now he's working for the Science Museum of uh, Minnesota and as an exhibit designer, and it just shows, I guess, a little bit about how immigrants and refugees stories um, are and how they're just like any of us. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm that. excited for that. And that's coming out uh, later this fall. Perfect. I love graphic novels. I love them. So I'm excited to hear about that. How about where readers and listeners can find you to either learn more about both of your work, the best place to reach out on social media, are there any places that you'd like to share? Yes, my website, www.kaokaliayang.com. That's K-A-O-K-A-L-I-A-Y-A-N-G.com. But if you Google me, there are also lots of talks and lots of videos, um, interviews. And so that's sometimes a fun way for young readers, especially, to meet me first via videos. Yeah. Yeah. And adult readers who got to learn about your adult fiction or your adult uh, text as well. That was me. <laughs> yes. And Ku, how about you? Where's the best place to find you? 
Um, my website is um, www.koovoo.me. And then I'm not very active on Instagram, but I have an Instagram account. It's um, at K-H-O-U-V-U-E illustration. Great. Well, I will be sure to put links to all of those places in the show notes, as well as links to Cage and the other books um, that were mentioned as well, so that readers, listeners can find them quickly and easily and enter into your bookish world. Thank you so much to you both, both for this beautiful book and for spending time with us at the Kid Lit Love podcast today. I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. I'm delighted that we can make this conversation happen and that I got to meet Ku for the first time. And then to be in conversation, this is the first conversation I think we've had with anybody on this title. So Stephanie, thank you for your generous reading and your your beautiful um, spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me a lot. Oh, you're you're so welcome and listeners. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Get of the Kid Lit Love podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Kid Lit Love podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes at alitlife.com. And if you want more, you might like to listen to my other podcast called Get Literate. It's a podcast that explores all things books and reading, notebooks and writing, and everything in between to build a life you love. One more thing. If you love what you listen to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a bookish friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish community of kid lit love. Thanks for listening. Thank you.